starting with page 18 this time. We just did two and three electron groups. Now we're going to do four electron groups around the central atom. The electron geometry is going to be called tetrahedral. The bond angles will be 109.5 degrees. And the hybridization will be sp3 hybridization, so sp3. An example is going to be CH4 methane. We'll draw the Lewis structure first. Lewis structures do not have to show shape. They can. What Lewis structures have to show is all of the bonds, all of the atoms, and all of the lone or non-bonding pairs of electrons, of which there are no lone pairs in uh, CH4. The carbon atom, uh, we'll do this one more time, and then uh, Let's see, 1s2, 2s2, 2p2, that's the six electrons for carbon. Draw the orbital energy diagram. We have 1s and 2s, which each have two electrons in them. Up and down, up and down. 2p. Three orbitals in 2p. Uh, there are only two electrons, though like so. We know the answer already. There are four electron groups. There are uh, four hybridized orbitals. Coincidentally, since there will be four bonds, we are also circling four electrons. And what we're left with over on the carbon atom hybridized area, nothing changes about the 1s. 2s and 2p, however, are at the average, let's see, it's mostly 2p at this point. And those are supposed to be boxes. Four sp3 hybridized orbitals, each with one electron in them. And that's all there is to it. Now, the shapes of these are going to be a little weird. Um, I, we have four orbitals. They will now form uh, the shape called tetrahedral, which is in the shape of a tetrahedron. When we draw the shape of CH4, what we were actually drawing is something that is three-dimensional. We are no longer drawing a planar object. I have a demonstration of what that looks like here. I think. There we go. This is carbon with four hydrogens around it. Yep. Try that again. Carbon with four hydrogens around it. Now I'm rotating it. You can see that they are not all planar. In fact, uh, some of them are behind the other ones. This is not a planar molecule. And we'll just set it to rotating here so that you can see it. Each of these angles is 109.5 degrees. What Vesper says, valence shell electron repulsion theory, is that each of these uh, bonds and the atoms that go along with it are as far apart as possible because the electron groups the areas of electron density repel each other. So because this is a non-planar molecule, we're going to have to draw it in a non-planar way. Let me see if I can get it to rotate. Let's stop that. I may not be able to. into my preferred drawing place. Close. There we go. Uh, 
there. Okay, see how one, two, three are down and one is straight up? That's what we're gonna try and draw in this picture. Here's our carbon in the tetrahedral shape. There will be one position straight up. There will be one position to the left. There will be two positions, one of which comes out at you. And so this one is coming out at you. So when I draw this bond, I'm going to draw a sense of forced perspective. What does that mean? The line gets bigger, dramatically bigger, ridiculously bigger, and the one that's behind the page has a dashed line going backwards. So H that's closer, H that's behind the page, H that's straight up, H that's to the left. Okay. That's how we ask you to draw the shape. This one, since it's coming out at you, is called an out wedge. This one, which means that this H is behind the page, is called a back wedge or an in wedge, but I tend to call it a back wedge. And this is how we draw the shape of a tetrahedral. Always, okay? All right. Now, uh, we will not do the orbital overlap diagram. Uh, it gets increasingly complicated as you go into three dimensions. Um, and let's see, yes, let's keep going. Other examples, two more key examples of tetrahedral electron geometries are going to be NH3 ammonia. If we draw the Lewis structure for ammonia, it would look like this. It would have one, two, three, four electron groups. Remember, a lone pair of electrons counts as an electron group. That means that this is electron geometry tetrahedral. SP3 hybridization and bond angles of 109.5 degrees. Although we're gonna say something about that in a minute. Let me draw the shape. Shape is going to be nitrogen. Uh, let's put the pair of electrons at the top. Off to the left is one of the H's. Coming out at us is another H. Going back into the page is another H. All of these angle down below this midpoint of the nitrogen. Okay. And now, about this bond angle. Bond angle is perfect, meaning a perfect 109.5, unless there's a pair of, or one or more pairs of electrons. Uh, a pair of electrons is a more concentrated or a more negative uh, source of uh, negative charge. So let's say, uh, and this, uh, an electron pair or a non-bonding electron pair uh, is more negative than a bond. Meaning, think of these electrons in this um, electron group as uh, since there's no bond here, it can act more concentrated around the nitrogen. A non-bonding electron pair is more negative than a bond and pushes the bonded atoms away. So the HNH bond angle is less than 109.5. And this is generally true 
This is an add-on to the Vesper theory that is that electron, non-bonding electron pairs push add bonded atoms farther away so that the bonded atoms have less than 109.5 degrees. And that's all you have to remember is that if there's a pair of electrons on the central atom that the bond angle for the atoms is less than 109.5. It's only a couple degrees and I don't think it's worth remembering the number. However, the same thing happens here for water. Water is perhaps the most important Lewis structure, shape, etc. molecule that we study. We look at oxygen, one, two, three, four electron groups, tetrahedral. Now there are two electron pairs. This time I'm going to put the two electron pairs down here in this position out and back into it, into the page. And just put the two H's. Now this is a bent molecule. in which because of the two electron pairs, the bond angle is even a little less. It's right around 104, whereas ammonia was around 107. It's only a couple degrees each pair of electrons. And what you need to remember is that this bond angle is less than 109.5 degrees and more electron pairs on central atom, more non-bonding electron pairs, more non-bonding electron groups. Equals small, slightly smaller bond angles. We'll just say smaller bond angle for atoms. And this is a general statement which is worth remembering. And this is a Lewis structure and shape and electron geometry that are all worth remembering because it is water. Now we can have expanded octets, which means we can have more than four electron groups. We'll have five electron groups around the central atom. And when we do, the electron geometry will be trigonal bipyramidal. So two trigonal pyramids, and we'll draw that shortly. Bond angle, well, in this case, there will be bond angles of 120 degrees and 90 degrees. This is the only shape or the only number of electron groups that has two different types of positions, and we'll talk about that. Uh, hybridization. Well, five electron groups, five hybridized orbitals, S, P3, and then we run out of P's. But groups, atoms that can have five electron groups will be able to have expanded octets, and they will then have, after the S, after the P's, they will have access to D orbitals. So S, P3, D. That's five hybridized orbitals, five electron groups. The Lewis structure for uh, phosphorus pentafluoride, well, put in four fluorines, and at least for Lewis structure, just put the fifth one somewhere. Because Lewis structures show all electrons, all bonds, all atoms, but they do not necessarily show shape. We're not going to worry about the phosphorus atom uh, or when it is hybridized, although I will post this as a companion problem. We'll do six electron groups and then we'll talk more about how to draw these shapes. Six electron groups, electron geometry is called octahedral. I know, six electron groups and yet octahedral. Bond angle, only one again, 90 degrees. Six electron groups, six hybridized orbitals, S, P3, 
D2. Because this is, again, atoms that can have expanded octets. And here's a nice example, SF6. Put four, put the other ones just sort of in there. So many electron pairs to draw, but we will draw them. And again, we're doing this really by counting up our total numbers of valence electrons. We're just taking shortcuts because perhaps at this point we've done so many Lewis structures. Hopefully that getting to this point is hopefully straightforward. I'll post uh, this part down here as companion problems because now we're going to talk about the shapes. Shapes for these, well, I'm showing the hybridized orbitals. You can see here the picture of them for five and six electron groups. I'm going to focus on this portion right here because one, two, three, these three are going to have bond angles of 120 degrees, and I'll draw that up here in a minute. Up and down, bond angles of 90 degrees. Let me show you how I would draw it. So here's phosphorus. One straight up, one straight down. One straight to the left or right. I'm drawing it to the right. From there, there are two orbitals on this side, one that's coming out at you, one that's going back into the page. Anything that comes out at you, that means it's going to be what's called an out wedge. So draw an out wedge, something like that, and draw a back wedge. Remember back wedges, and let me draw a big version of a back wedge now. It's going to be lines getting smaller and smaller as it fades away from you and behind the piece of paper. Fluorine, 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 fluorine. So technically these two fluorines are supposed to be one in front of another, but you do have to show them each. And uh, bond angles now. Bond angles from the bottom and the top to any of these middle ones is going to be 90 degrees. And in fact, let's just call these what they are. These three are what are called equatorial positions because they're on the equator. Equatorial positions. And equatorial positions are 120 degrees with each other. It's sort of like a mini trigonal planar right in the middle of the molecule. So equatorial positions are 120 degrees to each other. And then the bottom and the top, these are called axial positions. On the axis of the molecule, if you will, and from axial to equatorial. Ninety degrees. And so ninety, ninety from the bot the axial fluorine to any of these equatorial ones. Ninety degrees from this axial to any of these equatorial ones. And because there are two different types of positions. If there's a pair of electrons, a pair of non-bonding electrons always goes to an equatorial position first. A non-bonding pair takes an equatorial position. An equatorial position. And a second non-bonding pair takes a second equatorial position. And remember, we said non-bonding pairs of electrons were more negative than the bonds. 
So if you had a pair of electrons in one of these equatorial positions, it would push the other atoms to smaller bond angles. Still true. And um, the angles being 120 degrees means that these equatorial positions are slightly farther away from all of their neighbors than either of the ax axial positions. That's why a non-bonding pair assumes an equatorial position. Well, we'll see this as we draw them. Now, uh, shape of SF6, we said the name of this, oh, trigonal bipyramidal. So there's a trigonal pyramid from axial to the three equatorial. Here's another trigonal pyramid at the bottom. Two trigonal pyramids, trigonal bipyramidal. Here, octahedral. The shape made will have eight sides. Start with two of them going straight up and straight down. They're not called axial this time because the other four positions are all equivalent. They're all the same. The only reason we have different names for these is because they're not equivalent to each other. Now, in order to get the ones on the sides here, you do need an out wedge and a back wedge. And I'm coloring in these out wedges. And every single angle in here, all angles 90 degrees. And a pair of non-bonding electrons can go anywhere because they're all equivalent. And that's true for all of them except for five electron groups. A couple more things to go over here. Geometry of a double bond. Everything we've talked about as far as single bonds, when you look back at it, you will see they are all sigma bonds. Now is where we talk about something different. In the geometry of a double bond, let's take C2H4. If we draw this, and I'm going to draw this already in its shape. Each carbon has one, two, three electron groups. Each of these carbons is trigonal planar. And uh, so each of these carbons is a central atom. Each carbon is trigonal planar. Okay, now let's talk about this double bond. This, do so, sorry, step back. Each of these carbons is trigonal planar. Each of these bond angles is 120 degrees. And each carbon has sp2 hybridization. which means if it's sp2 hybridized, there is also one unhybridized regular old p orbital, so one unhybridized p orbital on each carbon. And it's a 2p orbital, and let's see if I can go back to my notes here. I have to go quite far back. Uh, one more. One, oh, there we go. We did sp2 for boron, but you can see that there's a 2p all by itself, no electrons in it, at least for boron. Um, and this time, um, it will have an electron in it. Okay, more about that later. But now, for now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this trigonal planar molecule. I'm going to turn it by 90 degrees. If I turn this molecule by 90 degrees, then this H and this H will stick out at us. This H and this H will rotate back. So... Uh, rotate 90 degrees and I'm going to rotate it 90 degrees so that these H's stick out.
when I do that, all right, I'm going to just draw this H with an out wedge, this H up here with a back wedge, like so. And now I'm going to fill in this gap in the middle here and talk about these two bonds that the two carbons share. Well, first off, one of the bonds will be because there is overlap of the sp2 hybridized orbitals, extreme zoom, sp2 hybridized orbitals, and this carbon hydrogen is also sp2 hybridized, carbon hydrogen is sp2 hybridized, and this bond is a sigma bond. Sigma bond formed by overlap of two of sp2 hybridized orbitals. And this is the lowercase Greek letter sigma. I draw it as a circle with a hat. There are other ways to do it too. Sigma. There is also a 2p orbital on each carbon that is unhybridized. And what's going to happen now is those 2p orbitals going to be in green. Oh, well, it's not quite a good drawing, but there's the top portions of each. There's the bottom portions of each. So these two areas are the 2p orbital for this carbon. These two areas are the 2p orbital for this carbon. And inside of those, each one will have an electron in it. These two electrons will be shared, and that is the second bond between these two. The second bond is what's called a pi bond. A pi bond has electron density above and below the two atoms. The two bonded atoms. So uh, here's the two atoms, the two bonded atoms nuclei. So here's where the nuclei would be for the two carbons. The sigma bond lies directly between them. So this one's a sigma bond. The pi bond is above and below. One of the ways that makes sense is because there's already two electrons between the two nuclei. If you wanted to form what's called a double bond, you should go above and below. And that is what happens. And what we will see is that sigma bonds are generally formed by central atoms and their hybridized orbitals. Pi bonds will generally be formed from unhybridized orbitals. And another way to remember it is sigma bonds tend to be formed by sp, sp2, sp3. Those all have S's in them, which is sort of sigma. Pi bonds tend to be formed from P orbitals, unhybridized. And maybe that's a way to remember it. So our new picture of a uh, double bond, and this is true for all double bonds, is that one bond is between the two nuclei, one bond is above and below. And so, a double bond 
always consists of a sigma and a pi bond. And another way of saying that is that the first bond between two atoms is always sigma. And the any ensuing bonds, the second and even the third, which is coming up, are always pi bonds. That is geometry of a double bond. It is always above and below, uh, between and then above and below. Last slide for this talk. Give us a little more space. Now the geometry of a triple bond. Great example. C2H2 acetylene. C2H2. There is a triple bond in there. This is the hardest to draw. Let me try and demonstrate it first. Um, although let's even go over the hybridization. So this carbon, which is the same as the other one, has two electron groups, which means it is uh, linear. Bond angle from H to C to C is 180 degrees. And hybridization, well, two electron groups, two hybridized orbitals, just sp. If it's sp hybridization, then there are two unhybridized p orbitals on each carbon. Hybridized uh, p orbitals. I feel like I spelled that wrong. On each carbon. Okay. And so this triple bond will be sigma bond plus pi bond plus pi bond. Now, all right. So... Uh, between me and the screen, there's going to be a sigma bond between the two of us, okay? There, there we go. Sigma bond. Carbon. Carbon. Okay. Then, so sigma between the two. Then there's going to be a pi bond here, right? Side to side. And then there's going to be a pi bond here. Okay. So the two pi bonds are 90 degrees with respect to each other. And the sigma bond, whoop, the sigma bond goes straight in between the two atoms. And that is very hard to draw, but we're going to try to. All right. So, here's my two carbons. Let's just keep things simple, draw the H's like that. All right, so one of these sigma bond, one of these bonds is the sigma bond right like this. And it's going to be sp. And then there will be a pi bond that goes above and below, and a pi bond that comes out. And, uh, well, how you typically draw this is something like that. That is one of the pi bonds. And let me see here. Cheating.
here is half of the other pi bond coming at us, and then there'd be another half underneath the page like that. So here's half. So this is truly a three-dimensional structure that we're trying to make here, and we only have two-dimensional paper. But what I would normally do is it would sort of block the view of the pi bond, so we'd sort of draw it, or sort of the sigma bond, and you'd sort of shade it in because it is coming out at you, and then it'd dash it in back there and it'd be hard to see. That's a triple bond. What I would remember is sigma, pi, pi. And with that, we'll end this video.